This week, we meet a former helicopter pilot who was once the personal assistant to Prince William. This is new National MP Tim Costley's backstory. So I grew up in Palmerston North. Mum and Dad were both school teachers. Mum was home with the kids. You know, it's the 1980s, it's meeting three veg. Dad taught at the local high school, uh, which was great, until I was also at the local high school. Um, and then and Mum worked there part-time as well. I'm the middle child, so life was hardest for me. You know, I got the worst of everything. Uh, or in my version of history, I did. I guess my earliest memory is going to the Ohakia air show with Dad, and he took us out there when I was like seven or eight, and I remember him saying, you know, this is what his dad, my grandpa, did during the war. He was uh, on a bomber crew, and I remember looking up there at the pilots going, that's what I'm going to do. I want to I do that one day. I'd love to hear some of his stories from the from the war and what they got up to because you get this the sanitized version but like that the photo i've got of him standing outside a pub with um with his mates and a couple of young waitresses and they got a pint i'm like yes that's the kind of i want to hear those stories from the war so i just love the fact that we've got the connection that that's him back in the day he looks way cooler than i do but i was just always going to be an air force pilot and i never gave up on that i applied for the air force and I got through the testing and then the interview and you go up to Auckland for the final selection and I get to the end and they said, no, your leadership is too task orientated. And I think what they were saying was, you need to go and grow up. And if I look back at me as a 17 year old, I would say, yeah, you need to go and grow up. So I went to university, got three years of life experience and just grown up and applied again. And yeah, from there, much, much better. Sometimes things take me two goes in three years, but it works out. just feel Tom Cruise getting closer, can't you? I always enjoyed music and, and I was always relatively good at it and never the, like, never the best, but, but always pretty solid and I could play different instruments and I can sort of taught myself guitar and piano and played in the band, but I always enjoyed it. And then you just kind of want ghosts to come in and you know, you shake my nerve and you, and we're into it. I remember so flying down to Blenheim to start training on day one and had to fly through Wellington and taking off out of Wellington, the aeroplane rolls to the left. I'm sitting on the left by the window and I was like, oh, ooh. and I was like, oh crap, I can't feel like that. I'm, I'm joining the Air Force to be a pilot and here I am worried about a basic little turn. And a month later you get put in the cockpit for the first time and you go flying and upside down and it was just, yeah, it was amazing. We were in Australia, sitting around the bar at night, and I just had the guitar, and I was just singing, making up stupid songs about anything that was going on at the time. So it ends up on the internet, and it just went viral. You know, did I think it through at the time that this would be what my kids grow up seeing? Maybe not, but I figured it's better to have all your skeletons on YouTube than in the closet. I ended up in Afghanistan working um, for our special forces over there, which was an amazing opportunity. I wasn't flying there, I was on the ground. I was the first Kiwi sent overseas in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. My photo albums are filled with photos of helicopters and planes, but actually all the stories are really about the people. And, and the one thing I know that I will miss the most and that I will treasure the most from my Air Force time is the people. Afghanistan was probably the one time I actually was a, a little bit em emotional, like I remember Lucy, our oldest girl, was six months old at the time. I just remember sitting there, Emma, Emma had gone to bed and, and Lucy's asleep like two nights before I left and just writing them a letter just in case. You know, this might be the only thing she'll ever have to remember me by. And, and that kind of gets you a bit, right, when you think about that. And, and one of the guys um, that I was with did... Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it was when I'd been in Afghanistan a week that um, that we got the message that a friend had been killed back home in a, in a plane crash in 2010. It was well publicised at the time. Um, a guy called Nick, who I had spent a lot of my career with, um, I'd sort of followed him through, just always, you know, a couple of steps behind. He was, um, when I got to helicopters, his new co-pilot, he was a new captain. When I did my flying instructor course, he was the one teaching us how to be flying instructors. And it was on that course that we were both having our first kids at the same time. It was after Nick's death that I founded the Missing Wingman Trust, which is the charity that looks after um, Air Force families when someone's killed, injured, wounded or ill. Because um, I just remember, you know, sitting by myself over in a coalition base in Afghanistan thinking, you know, there'll be all this support around them right now, but what's going to happen in 18 years? 
and so I wanted to make sure there was going to be something that was there, that there would be something that could help help out and, and will never take the place of, of Nick, but could maybe just fill a little bit of that gap. My whole life is run by women, right? My wife, my three kids, my mum, uh, I've got no chance. Um, but they are awesome, and they're also different. You know, you've got one that's just into everything, give every sport a go. One is so, her, her level of empathy and compassion, and one that's just full of joy, will find the fun in any situation. So the, between the three of them, like, I just learned so much. Bye, have a good day. Bye. My version of the story is, I played it really cool, and I might have mentioned I worked at a Hakia, definitely didn't say I was a pilot. Her version is, hi, I'm a pilot. And we just kept in touch, but just clicked. I mean, literally the rest is, is history. She is just amazing. I can't say enough good things. She would hate me talking about her, um, but phenomenal. Like, she's the one that holds it all together. We are a loud family. Dinner time is loud. I'm lucky living a bit closer that, that maybe, you know, there'll be the odd morning where I'm at home and can, you know, send the kids off to school. But I'm also realistic enough to know that they'll be few and far between. Does the hat still fit? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's, it's always been a squeeze, but it's not really, uh, it's not something I wear every day just walking around the house. How do you end up wearing for Prince William? I have no idea. A vague email got sent out to uh, a group of people, I don't know how they selected that group, and said, there's a job next year for a little bit. Uh, that's how it might involve a visit or something. Is anyone interested? And I went, yeah. And then I get a call on like Christmas Eve uh, saying on January that X be in Queenstown. This is what uh, Prince William and Princess Catherine and even baby George gave me um, at the end of my time working for them. Signed photo of the three of them. I remember getting to Cambridge and, and we drive into the middle of town and the crowd is just going crazy, like it's just loud. And as they go to open the door, when they get the all clear, the whole crowd, this hush just comes over the crowd. I remember one cool story. We were leaving the Wigram Air Force Museum, or we'd been down there, and they would break off from going to the vehicles and they'd go along the crowd, because people turn up with flowers, but inevitably the security dragged them back, no, come on, you must jump in the car. And I saw this one little girl that had been missed at the end of the line standing there with her, with her flowers, and I just rushed over, and I, and I knelt down next to her and I said, would you like me to give those flowers to the princess? Oh, yes, please. And then on the plane, uh, on the way back to Government House, I could give them to the princess, say, hey, there's a little girl that would just love you to have these flowers. You know, and, and that's kind of been the story of my life, whether it's been that or the charity or now as, I hope, as an MP. I know I can't make a world of difference, I can't change the world, I can't fix everything, but there's always one little person that you can help. And, and if I can do that, if I can metaphorically take some flowers to a princess for a little girl, that would be amazing.